I have a lot of fun through the week preparing for Sunday. <coughs> I get to open up the Bible and go, okay, what do you have for us this week? Are you one to quarrel? Yeah, don't say that too quickly, John. <laughs> I want to read some scriptures to you. This is, um, God's word is so very practical for us. Proverbs 15, verse 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Proverbs 17, verse 14. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, so drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Proverbs 17, verse 19. Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Ouch. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. Proverbs 19, verse 13. A foolish child is a father's ruin, and a quarrelsome wife is like the constant dripping of a leaky roof. Go to the New Testament, 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. And the Lord's servant must be not be quarrelsome, but, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Now, we started with the Proverbs, for the most part, but this morning we're returning to the red letters. These are the, the words that Jesus spoke in the order that he spoke them. And the last message from this series, which was last fall, was taken from the time that Jesus told Peter to go fishing and told him to fish in an unconventional way for Peter. Instead of using a dragnet, he told him to take a line and a hook. So Peter had to step out of his comfort zone. But when he caught a fish, Jesus had told him to look inside the mouth and there was a coin for which they could pay both Jesus and Peter's temple tax. Well, what's next? We continue in the unfolding of their lives. Our foundational passages this morning, they all relate to each other. There, there are different uh, articulations of the same thing. Matthew 18, Mark 9, and Luke 9. Primarily in Matthew 18 this morning. And we see that on this occasion, after the catching of the fish, the paying of the temple tax, the disciples have been walking together. They've been walking along the road. They're going towards a home in which Jesus is in. And they begin to argue. I love the Bible. There's no facade. It just shows people for who they are. No pretense. They begin to argue, the disciples. And the argument, as arguments do, becomes a heated dispute. Now, Tony Gaskins, which is a motivational speaker, I heard him once say, arguing isn't communication, it's just noise. Hmm. Do you ever quarrel? And if so, what do you argue about? The details of memories? That's not the way it happened. Well, it is so. And you'll argue that mem about that memory until you're blue in the face because, hey, you couldn't be wrong, right? Hmm. How about things you said? You said such and such. I most certainly did not. What I said was, oh no, you didn't. That's not what you said. <laughs> Sometimes we argue about opinions. Global warming is just a hoax to promote green energy. Are you serious? Have you not seen the polar caps melting? And the argument ensues. Or politics. Donald Trump will be remembered as the greatest president of all time. <laughs> Out of your mind? Everyone knows Bill Clinton was the greatest. <laughs> well, Wayne Gretzky might be called the great one, but Bobby Orr was the greatest. Oh, give me a break. Everybody knows Gordie Howe was the full hockey player. And we argue. And we argue. Because for some reason, being right about an issue is important to us. And then arguments tend to morph into patronizing comments to the other person. How can you say that? The insinuation is, you must be stupid. Arguments tend to heat up to the point where brutal insults are exchanged. 
and a person's character is assassinated, you're such an idiot! I see a lot of you smirkings, and this is familiar, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. We quarrel. And though we may lose a friend or wound our spouse, we're going to win the argument no matter what, no matter what the cost is. Win you might, but it may come with the loss of respect, goodwill, affection. Well done. You won, you big loser. What is it the disciples were arguing about? They were arguing amongst themselves about who would be the greatest in Jesus' new kingdom. I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest because I'm the one who caught the, who, who caught the fish. You got the coin. I'm, I'm the favorite. Peter, shut up. You're the one who sank out of the water. And they argued. And it became a dispute. Childish, isn't it? I'm better than you. When we were children, we would imagine what it would be like to be an adult. And then one of the great disappointments of adulthood is the realization as to how many adults still behave like children. Have you ever wondered what prompted the argument amongst the disciples? I'm the greatest? Well, we might say there was a cultural influence. The religious folk of that day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they believed in their own superiority. They did everything out in view so people could see how wonderful and great they were. If you wanted the best seats, it was reserved for the great ones. Either the right side or the left side of the the head of the table. It doesn't matter how you justify it, how you measure it. At the base of the aspiration to be great is pride. I will sometimes have fun with Meg. We'll be doing a puzzle together in our basement and I will get a piece in and I'll say, look at Maggie, I'm the greatest puzzle doer in the whole world. And she'll say, Daddy, well, I am. I'm the greatest puzzle maker in the world. She'll go, Daddy? She intuitively knows that my attitude and my claim are on shaky ground. <laughs> smells like pride. We may have laughed, but we probably also winced when Muhammad Ali used to say, I float like a butterfly, I sting like a bee. Yes, I'm the greatest. I'm Muhammad Ali. Not like pride. The Bible says that God opposes the proud, he gives grace to the humble. That's James 4 6. So to disagree is normal, to debate, have an exchange of ideas is healthy, but to argue to the point of a verbal fight is evidence that pride is rooted in your soul. Watchman Nee calls pride the poisoning of our spirits. Pride invokes an attitude of self importance and self conceit. And listen to what James chapter 4, verse 1 says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires to battle within you? And then it goes on to say that God opposes the proud. He gives grace to them. Ed Silvoso said, pride is like bad breath. <laughs> the person who has it is often the last to know. So it was with the disciples that day. They were arguing. There was no small quarrel amongst them. Arguing like children who was the greatest. They needed a breath test. They needed to see that pride had crept in. Now when we hear other people quarrel, we think to ourselves, Oh, grow up. You're acting so childish. Jesus responded a little differently, though, to the disciples that day. They were grown men. He didn't tell them to grow up because they were acting childish. He said, grow down. Grow down. You want to act like children? Okay. Let me give you something virtuous about a child that you can model. Grow down. 
and imitate this. And the first thing Jesus said, and we get this from Mark 9, verse 35, and I love how nothing is in the Bible by an accident. It begins with these words, sitting down. Jesus sat down in the midst of his disciples, sitting down. Now to sit down in those days didn't mean pulling up a stool like I do on Sundays. It meant getting down on the floor on a little mat. It means, so here the disciples are all standing around him and Jesus lowers himself on a small mat. That's not by accident that the Bible says that, by the way. <coughs> sitting down. He's modeling the substance of his words. And then he goes on to say, who any, anyone who wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. You see, greatness is not to be measured by the metric of your position in line, your seat at the table, or even being at the table for that matter. It's not about title, it's not about awards, it's not about income, it's not about popularity, it's about serving, it's about having the attitude of a servant, it's about living as your life as one who serves. That's how God measures greatness. And then we turn to Matthew's account, Matthew 18. And we see in verse 3 that while the disciples are standing and Jesus is Lord himself, he calls a child, a little child, into the midst and has the child by his side. He's at the child's level now, isn't he? He's not standing looking down on the child. Jesus says that's the level of the child. He says, truly I tell you this. He's talking to the twelve who have just been bigger about who's the thing. He says, unless you change and become like little children, <coughs> you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever takes the lowly position of this child, by the way, in that culture, children were not valued. Not until they were teenagers. They become men or women. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes him. But he starts off, unless you change, unless you get rid of the pride, the arrogance, the arguing, it's got to stop. You need to grow down and become like a child in a positive way. And the word for children here is, is not for teenagers. It's from where we get our word pediatric. It's pedia which means a little child, any word from the tw age 12 down. When Jesus was 12 years old and he was missing, and his parents were looking for him, the word is pedia. Anything from there now. Now when I was a kid, maybe some of you have had this experience, and we had a full house for Christmas or Thanksgiving dinner, and the table was full of adults. Guess where the kids had to sit? At the kids' table. The card table, <laughs> off in the other room. This is where you belong. We were placed in the lower seats. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly, listen to me, that is exactly what Jesus is saying here. As an adult, intentionally <laughs> take the low position of a child. Choose the cheap seats. Put others before yourself. If you want to act childish, go for it, he says. But stop with the argument. Stop with the aspiration for greatness. Grow down and choose the position of the child. Put others before yourself. Okay, so we're going to start something that we're going to finish next Sunday. And we're going to come back to this. You'll see why. One of the saddest things is the impact, the affects, that quarreling, adults quarreling, has upon the children. We see this in homes, a family filled with contention. Big mouths say things that little ears should never hear. We see this in local churches where adults argue over the type of music, the color of the chairs, or whatever. <clears throat> so much for humility. Adults acting like immature children deeply hurt the children who are trying to grow up.
But Jesus chooses this moment with the little child behind, beside him to address this. And he begins to talk about causing little ones to stumble. And we're going to come back to that next Sunday. Because it's a world unto itself. The influence that we have upon our children. Whether we bless them or curse them. But what Jesus then, he comes back to this topic of dealing with the disciples who are in conflict with each other. In verse 15, and it's too often we separate the passage because Jesus has interrupted it to talk about the effects of arguing and, and childish behavior by adults on children. We want to come back to it. In verse 15, he says, if your brother or sister sins, and let's be honest, that's what quarreling is, it's sin. That's what the Bible says. It's not disagreement. That's okay. It's not debate. That's fine. Arguing to the extent that there's a dispute is a sin because pride is at work. What causes fights and quarrels among you, James the writer says, they come from your desires that battle within you. And he goes on to say in verse 6, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And so with the little child beside him, Jesus teaches the disciples and us, a paradigm to manage conflict. Now you've heard this before. You're supposed to go one to one, person to person, and address the issue. The Bible says in Matthew 18, if they listen to you, you have won them over. Now that doesn't mean that you've won the argument. It's not about that. It means that you preserve the relationship. You, you've maintained the relationship. And so you go person to person and you try to talk it out. If that doesn't work, then you take a second person, you get a third person involved who can act as a witness, a referee if you want. And the whole idea is you just keep it small so that gossip doesn't spread it to a larger group and poison a, a larger, a larger uh, assembly of people. And if that doesn't work, then it goes public to the whole church, as it refers to in that passage. But the only way for that model to work at all is if humility comes before honesty. You might have the courage and the guts to tell the person how you feel, what you disagree with, but if there's no humility there and there's just honesty, then that model isn't going to work either. People need to say what they mean, but not to say it meanly. Both persons need to be willing to grow down and become childlike in the sense of taking the lowly position of a child. And so herein lies the real problem. Because we're all sinners by nature, we don't naturally have the tools to resolve conflict. Because pride keeps sabotaging. Jesus isn't done now. And we need to talk more about this. Jesus gives each person in conflict a key, actually a set of keys, that can melt pride and bring resolution. In Matthew 16, verse 19, let's read it together. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, that's not the passage we're reading. That's in another passage, Matthew 16. But Jesus takes the same idea and puts it right into the context of resolving conflict. Matthew 18, verse 18. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus is giving us keys to transact spiritual business. One key binds, ties, or fastens. The other key unlocks, um, breaks up, unties. And the idea is, is even when you can't resolve the dispute through talking it over, you can still take positive action to save your relationship and protect those <coughs> around you. You can bind the spirit of pride in both of you. If you can humble yourselves for a moment and pray together and, and bind the spirit of pride, call it out by name. Ask God to contain the toxic waste in your soul to resolve the dispute. 
And that you can loose the Holy Spirit in humility in both of you. And it goes on to say, I tell you, that if any two of you will agree on earth about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. If you can agree that your pride needs to be bound and something more gracious like humility through the power of the Holy Spirit needs to be loose, let go in you. If you can focus on that larger piece, then the smaller issues which you're arguing over will come into perspective. Truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. This is in the context of resolving conflict. The word agree is from where we get our English word symphony. Bring your lives into harmony. And then the next verse, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there in the midst. You don't have the tools. So by discipline, agree together to bind pride. Agree together in prayer to release humility. Jesus says, if you can agree on that, if you can use those keys, it'll be done, and I'll be in your midst. In the midst of conflict, if you can stop acting like children and arguing, but grow down, agree and pray together to bind pride and lose humility, that's where the miracle will occur. Jesus will be present to transform you by the renewing of your mind. The spirit of peace can prevail. Don't we need this in our marriages, in the relationship we have with our kids? It's the red letters of Jesus. It's been there all along. So let me just let this soak into your heart right now. Let's read it again. Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's go to Matthew 18, 18 to 20. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gathered in my name, there. Why did Jesus say that? Because the disciples were acting like children and arguing about who's to be the greatest. And he said, let me show you what greatness really looks like. And this is how you get there. Heavenly Father, practical and yet hard. For the sake of our families, Relationships, our communities, our churches, our country for that matter, and for our vertical relationship with you, help us to remove, remove the contentiousness from our horizontal relationships so that you be glorified. We bind pride in our own lives right now, in Jesus' name. We pray that humility is released and grows. We loose it in Jesus' name right now. Because we know you oppose the proud. You give a grace to them. And it's the path to true greatness. Help us in Jesus' name, we pray.